In the CBC News tonight, stigmatization causing some COVID-19 positive people to be kicked out of their home. Barbados continues its lobby for more climate action funding. New facilities for some workers in the agricultural sector. And in sports, Deandra Dotton smashes an ODI career best as Wendy's women beat Pakistan. Broadcasting from our studios in the Pine St. Michael, this is CBC News Night, starting now. Very good evening to you. I'm Lisa Broom. Thank you so much for joining us. In our top story tonight, COVID-19 stigmatization is real. And it's reached a stage where people are now evicting their own family members who are under home isolation. This has been confirmed by manager of the Home Isolation Program, Dr. Adana Grandison. She shed some light on the issue last night during the People's Business, where the focus was COVID-19, isolation, vaccination and misinformation. What we are now seeing, unfortunately, are some family members who are simply stating, I don't want this person in my home. Unfortunately, we have also seen situations where there are family members who have kicked people out of the home. And, and you know, this is, these are some of the challenges that we have as it relates to stigmatization. Dr. Grandison also revealed another very alarming trend with people in home isolation. 375 COVID-19 positive individuals have refused transportation to receive further treatment for their condition. We, we know that these persons, especially for medical reasons, require not only to be assessed, but also require the medical intervention to help them based upon the symptoms that they would have displayed. Once you are assessed uh, and you are given, according to our traffic light system, um, a designation within that traffic light system, it does not always mean you will stay um, at that designated uh, color code for the entire duration of your illness. So my, my, my plea really is that if for whatever reason a medical assessor has assessed you, or you are demonstrating symptoms in keeping with a need for escalation of care that these persons would accept the transport and certainly accept the care. Meanwhile, COVID-19 continues to claim lives in Barbados. Two more Barbadian men have succumbed to the deadly virus, bringing the total number of deaths to 182. One of them was a 46-year-old man who died from the viral illness yesterday, November 7th, at the Accident and Emergency Department of the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. He was unvaccinated. Additionally, a 79-year-old man passed away at the Harrison Point Isolation Facility today. He was also unvaccinated. Well, Health and Wellness Minister Lieutenant Colonel Jeffrey Bostick has extended condolences to their family and friends. And 196 new COVID-19 cases, 82 males and 114 females, were identified by the Best Dos Santos Public Health Laboratory yesterday out of the 1,163 tests conducted. The new positive comprised 43 people who were under the age of 18 and 153 who were 18 years and older. There were 915 people in isolation facilities and 6,780 in home isolation. Now, under the National Vaccination Program, the total number of people with at least one dose is 150,437, or 65.9% of the eligible population. A total of 129,966 people, which is 48% of the total population or 57% of the eligible population, have received their second doses and are fully vaccinated. Now, with regards to COVID-19, the month of October was a deadly one. Barbados recorded an unprecedented number of deaths and thousands of cases. And Shane Jones joins us live now to take a closer look at those numbers. Shane? 
Thanks, Lisa. Well, no two ways about it. October truly was a scary month and the most devastating for Barbados since our first case back in March 2020. So the question is just how bad was it? Listen to this. In the 31 days of October 2021, Barbados recorded 9,414 positive COVID-19 cases for an average of 303 cases per day for the month. Now, What's really telling about that number is that between March 2020 and October 1st, 2021, Barbados recorded 8,609 cases. Now that means that October alone accounted for more cases than the last 18 months leading up to it put together. And in doing so, we smashed the highest one day total on six different occasions. October 11th saw 342 new cases. That record was then broken four days later with 346 cases on the 15th. Then three days later after that, uh, the Best of Santos Public Health Lab revealed a new record of 382 cases from the tests conducted on the 18th. That wasn't the end to those toppling numbers, though. 392 new cases were recorded on the 20th. Then, on the very next day, we broke that 400 ceiling for the first time, uh, recording 427 cases on the 21st. And then on the 25th, we had our last record-breaking day for the month, and that saw 445 new cases. Lisa, now, something that we must note is that October also put to bed the notion of COVID-19 being a problem only for the elderly, as 2,000, as you can see right there, that number, 2,059 people under the age of 18 contracted the virus in the month. That's 21.87% of the total number of cases for October. And as I've been saying, it was the deadliest month for Barbados, recording 78 deaths in the month. Get this, that's the exact same number of deaths recorded between our first death on April 5th, 2020 and September 30th, 2021. That's how serious it was. Now, in terms of vaccines, October saw 12,985 people getting their first dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. And the percentage of the population totally vaccinated moved from 39.1% right there to 46.8%. So this was a breakdown just to show how rough the month of October was on Barbados regarding the COVID-19 virus. Back to you, Lisa. Thanks, Shane. Well, the public can now access COVID-19 testing in the city of Bridgetown as the Ministry of Health ramps up Barbados testing capacity. Queues began forming outside of the Queen's Park steel shed from as early as 9 this morning as dozens of Barbadians turned out to be tested. The Queen's Park Testing Centre is expected the, to reduce the pressure placed on polyclinics while providing additional COVID-19 testing options for the island. And we're also hearing tonight that the 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. curfew has been extended for another week. According to the latest Emergency Management COVID-19 Curfew Directive, which comes into effect today, the current curfew will be in place until November 15th. In other news now, the retail price rather, for gasoline remains at $3.95 per litre, but Barbadians are paying more for diesel and kerosene from today. Diesel will now be sold at $3.28 per liter. That's an increase of 12 cents, while the price of kerosene has risen by 5 cents and will be retailed at $1.43 per liter. Meanwhile, the retail price for liquefied petroleum gas or LPG has decreased. The adjusted price of the LPG 100 pound cylinder will be $155.36. The 25 pound cylinder $43.94. The 22 pound cylinder $38.83. And the 20 pound cylinder $35.30. And these price adjustments are in keeping with government's policies of allowing retail prices to be reflective of those on the international market. A recent proposal by the International Monetary Fund to make billions of dollars for climate action available to low- and middle-income countries is still falling short of the mark. This suggestion from Minister in the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Investment, Marsha Cattle. She was taking part in the first high-level ministerial dialogue on climate finance in Glasgow as part of COP26. 
While some $50 billion in special drawing rights, or SDRs, has been allocated by the IMF, Minister Cattle suggests what's really needed is $500 billion. We, when we take a proportion of those annual issuances of SDRs, in the first instance it could be over three years and then we do a review, but that will give any investor in mitigation or adaptation projects the right to borrow at the overnight interest rates of countries whose currencies make up the SDR, which are currently, those interest rates are currently near zero. And to roll over this borrowing for as long as the project continues to deliver some minimum rate of reduction in greenhouse gases or increase in adaptation per dollar invested. Noting that Barbados remains the largest issuer of, national, of natural disaster clauses in the world, Minister Cattle stressed that these types of clauses are needed in more debt instruments at the sovereign, global and multilateral levels. Working agriculture in Barbados has been moved to the next level. Three plantations, Mount Pleasant in St. John, Searles in Christchurch and Spring Hall in St. Lucie, are now fitted with mobile convenience units which were introduced today in ceremonies attended by officials of the Ministry of Agriculture and Food Security and the Barbados Workers Union. Trevor Thorpe was there. After more than 20 years, a new day has dawned in agriculture in Barbados. And the Minister of Agriculture and Food Security, Indar Weir, in praising the Barbados Agricultural Management Company and the Barbados Workers' Union, said it was also a promise made by government and told the gathering it was also the new way of working in agriculture. This is in keeping with the promise that we've made. And I want all Barbadians to appreciate the fact that even though we are going through a very difficult period, uh, the government is still performing and is still delivering on their behalf. Deputy General Secretary of the Barbados Workers Union, Dwayne Paul, said the mobile units should be the standard in the industry going forward, but the union also wants to hear about a maintenance plan. The union is pleased today, and as I said, the workers are, are happy, and that is what we strive for. We believe that um, we need to do more to signal to people that agriculture is an industry that is respected, that is the industry we care about and is a profession that people can gravitate towards. Charge Hand at Mount Pleasant Plantation, Kathy Ann Pinder, said it is a great improvement over what obtained in the past and the workers are happy with the developments now taking place in agriculture. It has what is necessary inside of it, the hand sanitizer, the bathrooms, which was always a problem, you know, not having the, the bathroom. So we have the, the bathroom, male and female, attached to the back. So I'm grateful. And I, I know I believe I speak for all the workers out there, you know. We are thankful. The mobile units can accommodate up to 10 persons under the COVID-19 protocols. And laborer at Searles Plantation, Sophia Burke, said she likes the new facilities. I like your bus too, right? But this one is work here. We enjoy it. All we can do is make sure we don't damage it. We can keep it clean and everything. But all is well. Trevor Thorpe, CBC News. Thanks, Trevor. Minister of Home Affairs, Information and Public Affairs Wilfred Abrams is among those paying tribute to popular radio DJ John Doe. The DJ, whose real name was Warren Fort, was an assistant program manager and supervisor at Hot 95.3 FM. He died yesterday after collapsing at Starcom Network Studios. Minister Abrams says he's saddened and shocked by Fort's passing. Warren was a very popular radio personality and the favorite DJ of many with his morning show at Hot FM. I know that musicians and others in the entertainment sector, his colleagues in broadcasting and his radio fans will miss him deeply after his almost 22 years on air. Warren's passing, following so closely upon that of another Starcom personality and legend, the veteran broadcaster Dennis Johnson, adds to the grief of staff members at the company but more broadly, brings home to us the role and impact of media workers in our society. I offer my deepest condolences to Mr. Fort's spouse, relatives and friends at this time of loss. The Barbados Association of Journalists and Media Workers, Barjam, has also been paying tribute to Fort. Barjam President Keith Goddard says it has been an especially difficult past few weeks for media workers who've lost colleagues and friends suddenly. John Doe was talented and skilled at his craft, 
and for many years was consistently rated as the number one radio DJ in the country. But also, for those who worked with him, knew not only of his talent, but of Warren's quiet and unassuming demeanor when he was not on air, describing him as an approachable and warm human being who was loved by many and will be missed by all. The media fraternity wishes to extend sincere condolences to his wife Tracy, family and friends, and his Starcom colleagues. May he rest in peace. The Business Report is brought to you by SkyMall, serving you to make your shopping experience pleasurable. Barbados is looking at expanding exports into the United States with a new strategy of targeting the diaspora. The minister in the Ministry of Foreign Trade, Sandra Husbands, says to add to the $60 million of value in exports currently being achieved, the ministry will be pushing Barbadian foods and the production of those items. She wants Barbados to do with local products what the Italians were able to do when they introduced pizza and pasta to the U.S. markets. But that means engaging our food technologists. That means building your manufacturing capability. That means looking at core manufacturing uh, production, uh, maybe in the very market where you want to sell so you can save some money. And it means promoting that product. And so these are some of the things that we have on our work plan in relation to making sure that we can tap the diaspora and see how we can get some cassava pone and some Shirley biscuits and things like that into the United States market. Speaking on the Public Affairs Department's one-on-one -on -one program, which aired last evening on TV8, Minister Husbands also revealed plans to export Barbados rum to new markets. China would be one of the markets we would want to look at. Africa would be another market we would want to look at to be able to get rum into those um, homes and for consumption. The issue that we have with rum, however, is getting the molasses to make the rum. And uh, in order for the rules of origin to be met, to say it is a Barbados rum, you have to be careful with um, the ingredients that you put in and where you bring them from and how much transformation you create okay. with them to be able to still claim this is a Barbados rum. Well, new benefits are rolled up in the new One Union program. An initiative of the City of Bridgetown Cooperative Credit Union, they include point-of-sale card transactions for which credit union members will not be charged. And Chief Executive Officer Steve Bell told the business report a discount mechanism with businesses is already in the works for credit union members. All transactions done at our ATMs are free. In addition to that, if our members utilize their card at a point of sale at a merchant, that is also free to our members. Uh, I should also add that um, we, we are looking at some, some doing networking with our business owners to offer discount programs linked to our cards, but that will be for the future. Time for the second half in sports now. We head back over to the sports studio. Mark, over to you. Thank you very much. The Barbados netball team is in final preparation mode for our next month's two-match test series against Scotland and also a one-off match versus the Isle of Man. CBC's Anne-Marie Bork reports. The Bajan Gems are back on court training as they gear for the upcoming test series with hosts Scotland and Isle of Man. In the hopes of preserving their qualification for next year's Commonwealth Games, the series is an important one and the Gems will be looking to maintain their winning history over the 8th-ranked Scotland and 23rd-ranked Isle of Man. President of the Barbados Netball Association, Nisha Craigwell, says it's good to be back in international action. The top 12 countries in the world traditionally travel and compete at the Commonwealth Games, but currently Zimbabwe, who are ranked 12th, are not a Commonwealth country, so automatically the next team up is Barbados. Ironically, after Barbados, Cook Islands are ranked 14th, just two 
ranking points behind Barbados. So it is very important for us to play now to ensure that when the cutoff date comes on January 31st, that Barbados is in a position to compete at Commonwealth Games. As you may know, we have attended every Commonwealth Games since 1998, and we are going to ensure that this Commonwealth Games next year in July, Birmingham, Barbados will also be competing. With a good mix of youth and experience, the team will be led by the island's most decorated netballer, Latonia Blackman. And head coach Margaret Cutting is pleased with how preparation has been going. So far, the team have been doing very good. Um, we have some senior players here, um, Shauna Azor Bruce and Latonia Blackman. They are the senior um, players in the team along with um, Brianna Holder, Shanika Thomas, Shanika Wharton. We also have some new faces in the team and there's some younger players that the senior players will take over and help them through our tour. Not playing in, since 2019 and given a chance to play now in 2021, I am really happy to see that our national program is back up and running. As expected, the team will have to undergo COVID testing and a two-day quarantine period prior to leaving the island on November 24th. On arrival in Scotland, they'll have a one-day quarantine period and further testing before competition starts on December 2nd. Games will be played at Glasgow's Emirates Arena. We turn quickly to our earlier story about the price of liquefied petroleum gas or LPG, which has changed effective midnight last night. According to the Ministry of Energy, Small Business and Entrepreneurship, the 100-pound cylinder will now cost $162.61. The 25-pound cylinder, $45.75. The 22-pound cylinder, $40.43. And $36.75 for the 20-pound cylinder. Remember, you can continue to follow us here on TVA. You can also get more news on our social media platforms on Instagram at CBC News Barbados and Facebook at CBCNews.bb, as well as our radio stations 947, 100.7 and 98.1 The One. And that's news. Good night. Thanks for visiting us. To get more stories like this one, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel.